My name is Karina Harney, Playboy's Playmate of the Year, 1992. And I'm Echo Johnson, Miss January, 1993. Welcome to the Bunny Chronicles. Let's go. Hi. So, um, yeah, so we've so we've never met uh, Jim. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Well, Jim, it is very nice to meet you. Yeah. I'm Karina. Karina Harney. Karina so Harney. And I'm Echo. I have a beef stick in my pocket. I'm going to set that aside. <laughs> <laughs> And we were just, um, yeah, we were just kind of going down memory lane about the uh, Chicago offices versus West Coast because uh, Karina was shot by Fagley in Chicago, and then I was West Coast. But all right, so we have. Do you prefer James or Jim's? James or James or Jim's? <laughs> James or Jim? <laughs> uh, most people called me Peterson. I did not until recently. My kids call me dad. Everyone else calls me Peterson. Peterson. And uh, Let's do that. my memo pad at Playboys always had from Peterson. Okay. I don't know what it is. No one thinks my first name is important. Uh, well, Karina wanted to ask how you pronounce your, how do you first pronounce name? your name. She said, Jim. I said, no, Jim. <laughs> I am. That's a joke. It was a joke. Exactly. It was a joke. Um, okay, so this is. I'm so happy you're on here. We have had an incredible week of guests, and and you are our last guest, and I, one of the most pro- profound. We are definitely going to have on our interview. So, um, James Peterson, uh, Peterson, we'll call him, uh, was 40 years at Playboy from 1973 to 2003. Began as an assistant editor, and then promoted to senior staff writer by half. And you started working um, in the Chicago offices. One of I'm I'm gonna just start the show with with one of the quotes you gave me because it's amazing and he I also love has it. a book the century of well, sex yeah 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 we're gonna talk about that history. um so one of the most amazing quotes from yourself was Playboy made sex a legitimate a legitimate beat for journalism and journalists such as yourself and I really loved that when you told me that it uh, I was in the catbird seat I got to watch the sexual revolution happen right. And uh, the other thing I always say to explain that decade is that um, the sexual revolution happened on the newsstand. Now, I don't imagine either of you even know what a newsstand looks like. No, we, I don't yeah, know I do. My issue was on she's a newsstand. 50, I'm, and I think I'm 48. I'm yeah, not uh, sure. I'm not 50 yet. <laughs> My gosh, I have a whole year. Thank you. <laughs> Whatever. Her close. Huh. No, of course we remember the newsstands. And I was I would always run and get my newsstand specials because I was on so many covers. And I loved them. And that's a non-existent thing she's, these days. Yeah. The uh, beauty wa- was... Hefner's uh, genius was that he gave us permission to cover what was happening to us. Um, Arthur Kretschmer came in and hired a staff of young editors, and Playboy became the magazine in which we wrote about ourselves. Right. The artists that we liked. Uh, in the 50s, he said, Playboy was essentially a science fiction magazine with nudes. <laughs> and by the that. time uh, it reached its power in the early 70s, late 60s, uh, he gave permission for writers to talk about their lives as it was happening to them in the language it was happening. Uh, and I, you know, so, uh, we had articles on what it was like to live with someone mm-hmm. when uh, the proper term for living with someone was living in sin right, or right. fallen woman. And what kind of relationship happened when you just liked each other and didn't require rings or weddings or, uh, and there was, a, I was the playboy advisor. And when, they hired me to give uh, advice on fashion, food and drink, stereo, sports cars, dating dilemmas, taste or etiquette. Uh, most of the letters we got, and we got a thousand letters a month, were about sex and relationships. Um, and uh, my uh, people always ask what the top five letters were. And... Um, Probably number one was how do I increase the size of my penis? <laughs> really? Uh, 
And number two was my girlfriend doesn't reach orgasm mm. uh, without carnal knowledge with a black and Decker sander. What am I doing wrong? But men wanted to give their partner pleasure and there were no uh, guidebooks right. to do that. Uh, the sex manuals at the time uh, just said, oh, do foreplay. And it's there's no really defining how. what foreplay was. Yeah. Yeah, Without um, defining it, yeah. the <laughs> joke was, uh, well, I took over the advisor uh, that, in 1973. Will you explain a little bit what the advisor is for the people that are watching that probably oh, don't know? Oh, are we watching or talking? Uh, w no, we're recording. and But just so in the future, when, when it's put out that people know what the advisor was. Yes. Okay. Um, Someone once came to Hefner and said, we should do a parody of Ann Landers, who was the original sob sister, mm -hmm. a newspaper columnist who would answer problems from oh, her readers. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, Hefner said, wait a second. I like Ann Landers. Uh, let's not do a parody. Let's do an advice column. Uh, let's start a conversation with our readers. Uh, and... It was one of those things that uh, opened up. Playboy was participatory media, was interactive media before the phrase existed. We had right. letters to the editor. We had letters to the forum and we had letters to the advisor. Readers sent in party jokes, uh, but they started the people who wrote the Playboy advisor column a thousand letters a month. And, and, and you had 12 people, staff members that would respond to that, right? Yes, right. we had a uh, reader service department. Wow. And we would answer every one of those letters that had a self-contained stamped envelope. Wow. Uh, and uh, you have to think, those people had no one else to turn to mm -hmm. uh, for advice. Mm -hmm. They couldn't ask their parents. They couldn't ask their minister. And most of what they were interested in would qualify them for psychoanalysis in the prevailing climate sense yeah. of the time yeah. right, uh, right, sex right. was a sin or it was psychotic wow. uh, if you were doing anything other than sex in the missionary position within a marriage for procreation right so people wrote to this advisor column and i would read uh, reader service would answer them and i would go through every letter trying to choose 10 letters that I hadn't seen before. Mm -hmm. And then I would research them and write the answers that went into the magazine. And uh, people would say, you know, you're 25 years old. What qualifies you to give sex advice? And I said, I went to Boy Scout camp. <laughs> uh, the Boy Scout motto is be prepared. And so from the time I was 12, I had read everything I could uh, about sex in case it ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I came to Playboy uh, two years after Masters and Johnson published their groundbreaking research and the year that Alex Comfort wrote The Joy of Sex. Uh -huh. So I had medical knowledge. Uh, Masters and Johnson were friends of the magazine. I became friends of theirs. Uh, and Alex Comfort wrote an unapologetic manual about the joy of sex mm -hmm. simple mm -hmm. and, and even he was under constraints uh in 1970 the uh, book was something like 260 pages long and there were three paragraphs devoted to oral sex <laughs> and he called it something like mouth music mouth music there were 12 That's pages classic. there wow. were 12 pages devoted to bondage Three paragraphs to oral sex because you could write about bondage. That right. was classic English kink. Right. But uh, you couldn't write about oral sex. And uh, my predecessor at the uh, advice column had tried to answer a letter. What is the caloric content of sperm? Someone wanted to be able to. 
That's blow someone without blowing their diet. <laughs> blow somebody without blowing their That's diet. That's a book right there. I gotta there. write that down. Blow somebody That's without blowing, blowing your, your diet. diet. That's a, awesome. Um, that sounds it, like it, a nice it, little it, tabletop book there. Book. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> it turned out that it was like three to ten calories. It's mostly water and a few trace elements. You realize how hard it is to read the label on those tiny suckers? Right. <laughs> um, but the company that had published Playboy for two decades refused to put print that page. No way. They were afraid that they would go to jail. Wow. wow. And uh, I think I ran the letter at some point in 1973. I said, we can run this advice now. Um, but that that shows you we were the first magazine to talk about sex explicitly, not uh, not to arouse, although we try to do that sometimes. Uh, but it, to it, just it was fact real for it, information. It was, yeah, it and facts, obviously yeah. you gathered the information from the letters and the questions you right. received right. and you wanted to give people what they were asking yeah. for. Which I, was a beautiful belief, service. <laughs> if someone had the courage to ask a question, mm -hmm. I had the resources to try to answer it. Now, that's you awesome. would go and investigate as right. well. Like, right. that's what you did. So you would go find out. Like what... Plato's and tell me. Yeah, you had mentioned that. What is What was Plato's? Okay. This is um, Arthur Kretschmer was the managing edit, editorial executive and he called me in his office one day and said i want you to take a stroll along the sexual frontier mm -hmm. great Where's that great line but uh <laughs> he was the first person to put those two words together right and so i said okay and i would go to new york city uh explore s&m clubs uh public orgies. Plato's retreat had been the continental baths where gays would meet to do what gays ah, do mm -hmm. and where Bette Midler perfected her act singing to gays. And then someone bought the lease and turned it into a, a, a heterosexual orgy club. Mm -hmm. And people would drive in from Long Island to show what they had <laughs> learned in Long Island. Oh, the tunnel people. Were, <laughs> yes, in front of other people. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, these were, I went to a bar where it was, uh, where the waitresses were bar snacks. Whoa. And uh, it was a dollar a touch, <laughs> a dollar a lick. And they would come down and sort of lower themselves in front of you and say, ever want to be a gynecologist? Wow. And offered to pull aside the mystery screen. Mm -hmm. uh, it was one of the most welcoming bars I have ever been. People made use of the uh, dancers different ways. Uh, there was some guy playing pool and he would come back and, and sort of cue the woman and then go back and play pool and clear the table. There was someone who would come in a tall sort of Viking six foot six, and he would pick the woman up with one hand and cough her like a, a yard of ale. Wow. And if you did something that allowed the dancer to perform, uh, she would allow you to kiss the space between her breasts. Uh, this was, you know, a lovely. I have to and ask so, you. And revolutionary. So Hugh Hefner sent you to these places for research, correct? And I, I wanted to ask you, backing up here, do you remember the first time that you met Hef and what that experience was and how you came to be a part of the Playboy mm -hmm. family? I mean, how how were you hired? How did you even find out? What's that story? I um, worked at Psychology Today. It was my first job out of college. and That makes sense. Uh, Playboy just exploded through the roof uh, at the beginning of the 70s, and they started poaching writers and editors mm -hmm. from other magazines. And uh, a writer at Psychology Today slash Careers Today named Craig Vetter was hired by Playboy to be the first uh, staff writer. And he was sent on an assignment. Uh, the magazine had heard that 
uh, flights on Air Finlandia to Europe were airborne orgies. It was the cheapest ticket and all the hippies would get on this airplane and fly there, My have orgies there. in midair. So they sent Craig and Craig got to Europe and said, no orgy, but I'm gonna stay here for two or three weeks if you don't mind. And I heard this story and I said, my God, this is a magazine that has money to explore an idea they've heard about and to take the writer's word that there was no article. They didn't require that to justify the plane ticket, Craig had to write, there I was at 50,000 feet surrounded by new bio young hippies with only a bottle of Kama Sutra oil. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. So I said, I want to write for that magazine. And I showed up the week the previous Playboy advisor became a millionaire. A guy named Frank Robinson looked out the window of the office and saw a fire on the 80th floor of the John Hancock building. Whoa. And he said, how do you fight fires in a high rise? So dear Playboy advisor, how do you fight fires in a high rise? Wow. He researched it, wrote up a treatment for a novel, sent it to his agent. The novel, the agent called back, said, Frank, I got you $25,000 for the hardbound, $450,000 for the paperback. And $450,000 for the movie rights. Wow. You better start writing this thing. That's incredible. And that became The Towering Inferno. Wow. Oh, my God. That's yes. even no. more. Wow. And so I walked in and uh, Arthur Kretschmann, the executive editor, said, can you give sex advice? And I said, yep. I lied. But well, I, fi- I, I, I sure can, I, and I will. I, I figured I knew 10 things about sex, for sure. Right. It right. turns out that I had read nine of those 10 things in the Playboy Advisor. Uh-huh. And the 10th one was completely wrong, but a lot of fun to try. Uh, and so I sat down and started reading those letters, and it was probably that I was made for this job. I had been in training for this job all my life. Uh, So in those days, you would go over to the mansion on Sunday night to watch first run movies, watch Hefner play games. And this is the the mansion in Chicago? The mansion in Chicago. Nice. It was that, wow. that, that. Mind you, this is before both of you were born. Right, right. You uh, seem so young. It's mind blowing to me that. I, I, anyway, I'm I'm listening, but looking at you and it, wow, you just never know. <laughs> uh, you never know. I, you're only old once, but you can be immature forever. Oh, so, I love that. Yay. I'm gonna write that down. That's a good question. Yeah, you, but anyway, <laughs> I met Hef, Hefner, and. Uh, at that time, I, do you remember what it was like? Because what did you think about him? I mean, obviously, you it, realizing that's the place to be with the freedom to do the editorial uh, work that you mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. really longed for. Because there's we we keep talking about the obje- and, and the co- objectivity, and, cost, and, and today wasn't. you don't get the objectivity. You don't get uh, just being able to explore something without a biased opinion. It, I just don't see good writing. It's persuasive right. writing. It's not, hey, this is an observation and this is information. That's but- right. And then also to to come back to the point that we keep um, talking about when we took the photographers and, you know, different people within the company that um, anything done at the magazine, oh, there was mm-hmm. no like no limit. It's like of cost, <laughs> yes, involved, and so you were able to go and do these things like you were talking about, and it wasn't, and it was honest, and yes. it was it was authentic, and it wasn't and frivolous it was, to have yeah, because yep, he yep. knew that this was something. It's that was it's the way the it had to be done. Revolution. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. they were exploring things, and it's healthy. I'm an, I'm, I I always believe in monogamy. That's my personal thing, but when sex and, is and, healthy, and, but yes. it's very healthy, and there are things that enhance a marriage things that you learn and that is a beautiful thing mm-hmm. there's that's it's wonderful to be able to please your wife or please your husband and and those things weren't being explored so really you're giving pleasure and and beautiful relationships to people i mean mm-hmm. that's a whole other psychological yeah. but but he was part of that and where people um, didn't know where to go there were at that time 
two editors in America who embody their publication. Jan Winter at Rolling Stone and Hugh Hefner at Playboy. That, that makes sense, Rolling Stone. Wow. And uh, so the thing I noticed about Hef was is it was my magazine myself. He started in the kitchen and put every dollar back into the magazine. That's right. He wanted to make the best magazine That's right. he right. could. Yep. And to be allowed onto that playing field was a privilege. Absolutely. Uh, that... Uh, and to be go to work with equally talented people in so many different fields, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I used to say, uh, "See you around campus." Mm -hmm. That's what it felt like. A it, it was that learning with the best, you right yeah. there on the cutting edge, right there, and it's and it, there, changing there was the course you, there of was America. Unity, and it was a family, and half and half new where your strengths were going to be and the positions that he put everybody in and then to co um, cohesively work together and to achieve, you know, but that dynamic and that level an, of perfection is but what there's occurred. An, but and just, innovation, of yeah, course. But the innovative, you know, scientists really, you look at of our, well, not our time, before our uh, time. Way before, yeah. Sadly, I wish there were innovators in this way. There's not. And and these, it was, a, mean, it was a moment in time. And that's what's so incredible about it. The, uh, it was a moment in time. And just with regards to the man, I have probably three separate opinions of Hefner because he was three separate people. That's interesting. Speak to uh, me. He worked his life so that he wanted to live the rest of his life on the kind of movie set you saw in the 1930s movies. Right. Uh, the Thin Man, uh, my man, uh, Godfrey. He wanted to live in a Busby Berkeley musical. Mm -hmm. uh, and both mansions look like the set of a Busby. So he would live on the set because right. he wanted to live the life he had dreamed of and wanted to be known for the way it looked. And it looked fantastic. Yep. And um, he would have one or two pictures showing him working on the round bed, you know, or a playmate jumping into the underground pool that this was his life. Right. Give him that. Sure. The other Hefner, he never showed you the work. Yeah, right. Nobody knew. He, you know, forget forget being on the round bed with a few pieces of paper. Yeah. It was nonstop. It was, work. yeah. It, it was and a living, it, breathing, 24 hour, 360 hours a year. And it was a very high quality work. Mm -hmm. And I'll get, get to that at the end. If he gave you an idea, it was usually worth pursuing. Absolutely. Uh, but to the degree of perfection, uh, he would look at a cartoon and uh, it would be a vaudeville cartoon. There would be a, a line of dancers and in front of it would be a vaudeville comedian telling it a joke. And you would get a note from Hefner saying, the left breast on the 13th dancer looks wrong. Amazing, his detail. And, his and detail. Uh, Lillian Mueller was a girlfriend who finally did a playmate. She's oh, yeah. coyly standing behind yeah. A goldfish bowl, and it took the photographer something like seven hundred takes to get wow. the picture that that has said knew. you've got mm -hmm. you've got Lillian, you've mm -hmm. got her, mm -hmm. but the goldfish in the goldfish bowl is looking the wrong way. Right? Oh my god! <laughs> the goldfish but are not in the right. That, but yeah. that's what that made detail the magazine. Yep. Yes, now, nice. that the that the level of detail was was breathtaking and he would not settle for second best nope. or, or good enough. Good nope. enough. He wanted perfect. Yep. Mm -hmm. And he by and large achieved that. Mm -hmm. Those magazines, uh, sometimes if you raid your grandfather's garage and can find stacks of the magazines from the seventies, they are gorgeous on every page, yep. not just the women, the artwork. Everything, the, the, the fonts, the way the paper felt. I mean, everything was so the meticulous. The interactive and, and, media, yes. all of it. And then it was even, brilliant. He, it was, even the way he balanced, it yeah. was all yeah. balanced mm -hmm. and symmetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the girls that he chose, I mean, 
in the articles that he made sure it, he knew who was going to go where. He knew he had so yeah. much in there to think yeah. about. You yeah. think about these yeah. writers. You think about all of the editorial end of it, and then the artistic end of exactly. it, and then the and he had his the, finger on the pulse the of playmate. every single ty- finite detail of the magazine, and that's what we're speaking to yeah. that people don't necessarily uh, have no clue. They think, oh, just oh, Hugh Hefner, the gigolo with like many yeah. girlfriends. It's like, oh God, you have no idea and then who this man careers. was. Careers, what? Where would you be without Playboy? Right. What would would your life been have had? been as full would you i mean what what are your thoughts there do you ever think that really was you know set the course of Mm -hmm. a true career do you think that way do you um i feel like i'm one of the luckiest people in the world same i knew when to say yes Mm -hmm. and then it just opened into what happens next uh i was giving an audience of like 25 million people uh and I, I have, I thought that the only person with a better job in America was Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I fair. I'll settle for being the Playboy advisor yeah. for twenty or thirty or forty. You know, yeah. of being the person responsible for talking about sex for that long. And um, the, I said it became a legitimate beat. Uh, you had the women's movement, women's rights. Right. You had right. pornography right. evolving into what's available on the internet. You had diseases. First, it was herpes. No, uh, Newsweek would put scarlet letter. Oh my you know, gosh. That they, that <laughs> the way the regular press dealt with any te- topic sexual was it was either a scandal or it could kill you. Right. And uh, Hefner said, demythologize. Get to the story. Get to the and truth. so we would talk honestly about herpes, which was just a, a trial run for AIDS. Yep. And uh, when AIDS came out, most of the mass media just fed the panic, created homophobia. And uh, uh, people like Pat Robertson would say it's God's revenge on homosexuals. Oh, thanks. Uh, and we just said, no, this is what we know about it. It happened. It can, uh, when Magic Johnson said that he um, had, was had HIV acquired HIV. the virus, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, the article that Playboy, Playboy published saying this is what we learned from this. This is what we know was unmatched anywhere on the newsstand. I think that's the best thing I ever wrote. Uh Never mind that the strolls along the sexual frontier when it came down to a medical health issue, we were able to talk about it in the language you could listen and uh, talking to the experts and really and, getting right, the facts right. and the truth. I find you know, Re- Reagan, President Reagan, didn't mention AIDS for like four years. How many deaths are traceable to that? Uh, and so we we weren't afraid to wade in. That would be the best way to say it. When we waded in on race, we raided in on the Vietnam War. Yeah. We waded in on uh, and everything that was going on that was that was controversial at that time. I, it makes you wonder. I can't help but wonder. I always think what would have been written. What would have been the story on the pandemic in the issue? And just what our current sto- culture right now. I mean, I think oh my Hef would just be so disheartened and appalled. Uh, print has pretty much disappeared. I will read The Atlantic, The New Yorker, sometimes Wired. Uh, and the Smithsonian. I get my breaking news from the History Channel. I love that. You know, so, mm-hmm. uh, but almost no one has the room to do something in depth. The interview right. was unmatched anywhere in any media. Uh, and it was, it was always a both doubt. I mean, he without would get... He would go straight to, and it was. I mean, it he wasn't would spend right sometimes or left. It was days whatever. on these on these interviews, yes. right? I mean, hours and hear it on from end the horse's from, mouth, yeah. and it was very in depth and candid, and people candid, yeah. trusted mm-hmm. you. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it, it trusted these 
the the Playboy writers, the, the, the print, the the publication. Yes. And yeah, it was more relaxed. You know, it wasn't. I'm worrying about what I'm going to say. Exactly. Was, hey, I'm going to get is... canceled because I say this bullshit. Yes. You know. Well, you would get the whole person. Oh yeah. And that you don't get on any media um, mm -hmm. today. No, no they no. paint whatever and, they want. They and people, uh, the, the writer would spend weeks sometimes until he became part of the family. And oh, that's wow. when you get to the, you know, the uh, Jimmy Carter saying, I lust in your heart. That was into a, a response at the end of several days. And Barry Golson was walking out the door and he turns around and says, what about, you know, all people think you're a fundamental Baptist. How do you deal with sex? And, he's, and he just says, I lust in my heart. And that one remark humanized him right. enough that he won the election. People weren't afraid wow. of the Southern uh, Baptist. Uh, and sad. that kind of incidental influence. Uh, someone has, has asked me, what was it like? What, someone wanted to do a screenplay or a docudrama uh, like Mad Men about Playboy. And I said, uh, go with the personalities. Uh, because the actual place we worked at was see around campus. You'd yep. gather over the coffee table and uh, talk. And the number of ideas that came out of those conversations filled the magazine. The magazine was the magazine of record of our hallway conversations. Oh, that is uh, fascinating. Wow. That makes sense. And I was taking this somewhere. Oh, um, so we had a guy named Alex Haley who would do interviews and Hefner would send him to interview George Lincoln Rockwell or Miles Davis or, and Alex was just another one of the guys, a very good interviewer. And Murray Fisher worked there. Uh, he edited the interviewers. And then he started working with Alex, trying to put Alex's life story into sh shape and well, okay, we ran two chapters of that book in the magazine. It was called, and then a year later, you saw it on television as Roots. Wow. And oh the gosh. television show wow. changed America. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was just daily business. Right. Yeah, yeah. It was the norm. It was the daily norm. It was the norm. Yeah. And, yeah. oh, uh, that's an interesting article, Alex. I didn't know this about it. Okay, see you around. Uh, and then it would go out. And just literally changed the world. Exactly. Yes, changed it the did. World. Well, what was the third thing that you were going to say that you, you said how there was three, you know, per personalities or three versions of how, what was the third one? Um, at some point, uh, okay, 1973, he said, I want to do uh, a book, The History of the Sexual Revolution. Mm -hmm. But not the one that started with me. Hmm. Go back a hundred years and tell the story. He loved history. I love that. And, and uh, I said, I demand the right to do this. I want to see how we got this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, so that was a three-year project. Uh, it started with him sending me a 60-page single-space memo. Wow. about what he thought it should be. And then he asked me for the table of contents. And I said, 1910, 1920, 1930. I said, I don't know what I'm going to discover. Leave me alone. I'll go discover it. And he edited. He, he was the first reader on every word I wrote. And um, he was... a very harsh taskmaster. Mm -hmm. And I would get memos from him. Uh, there was a period where I thought if I met him, I would kill him. Oh, because the, the, amount, yeah. yep. the amount of obsessive abuse he was dumping on me. And then I realized, oh, wait, this is the voice in his head. This is how he talks to himself. Right. This yeah. is why he noticed the 13th breast on the dancer was wrong it, the, or the, the fish the, was looking. The consummate so, perfectionist. It yep. was his. Uh, mm -hmm. 
his but greatest weakness and greatest strength. He suffered his weakness, with that, absolutely, that but don't suffer realize, from that. Because you can't. Yeah. That's a and, lot. It made the, his day to day. But look how good it life. made everyone. It yeah. took them to the next yeah. level because yeah. he yeah. demanded yeah. perfection, yeah. which is yeah. impossible. But he wanted you to do the impossible, which was and done. it was achieved. <laughs> but as an editor, I wrote something in the like 1905. There was a physician named Prince Morrow, and Prince Morrow was the first person talking about venereal disease in, excuse me, in America. And he said, half of all wives have venereal disease. Half was reading this and looked up and said, whoever said this had an agenda. Yep. Wow. And I said, well, actually, uh, this guy went on to found the American Social Health Association started treating this uh, on a course of things that ended up years later with Planned Parenthood, Mm -hmm. he started public awareness that it was just a matter of health. It wasn't Mm -hmm. a sin. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you weren't a fallen woman. This happened between married couples where nothing was supposed to happen other than procreation. But he said, this guy had an agenda. And that, that he it's picked so up he on could, that. Mm-hmm, he was so mm-hmm, intelligent mm-hmm, and could read mm-hmm, things. Mm-hmm. He was a and he could time travel. Critic. Yeah. Oh, uh, he, you know, it was uh, that was the joy wow. of that book. Was yep. he said, yep. "I want to know. I want you to look at all. Of, I want you to read what was readable. I want you to watch what was watchable, and listen to what was listenable." Because he thought sex happened in music. Sex certainly was inspired by movies and the uh, what was allowed to be written was the history of censorship in america <laughs> and uh so i became well read i have a box of videotapes and movies i i did time travel through the century and it, it was uh there's no second act to that no uh, that's right. quite a ride yeah, that, that is that is fascinating time what traveling a journey is quite a ride and, and wow. with a man that for you know, decades, with, with him leading yeah. the and inspiring and leading and guiding. That's amazing. And uh, when we finally met for the launch party for the book, I still didn't know if I was going to kill him or thank him. <laughs> and he walked up to me and said, "Thank you. You saved my life." Wonderful. And uh, so. Uh, We had respect for each other. If he was concerned about a topic, he would call me up and say, what do I think about this? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Tell me what I think about I love that. All right, write it. I'll sign it. He knew the experts. Yep. He um, trusted. Mm -hmm. What a a gift that he had that trust in you. An honor, yeah. Absolutely. If you could say anything to him as if you were at his memorial or, or in memoriam, or before he passed, or, be- or you knew you were yes, going to see him and one you last knew you time. were going to be yeah. able to to say something to him. What would you say, Jim? I would say thank you for the wild ride, for the Excellent. for the stage, um, for the for the support. He created that universe, mm-hmm. and uh, I've had this conversation with Arthur. It was like being on a championship team. And um, it absolutely was. And every single one of us that we, you know, the, the playmates, but every single person that we have interviewed that has come on the show has, has been this, as simplistic as that, as just, just thank, thank you. you for giving me the thank ride you. of my life. Thank you. It'll never happen again. It was a moment yep. in time that we were so. I have, I always get goosebumps. I sit here with goosebumps. Just We were so fortunate to be a part of, and it's just, yeah, just, uh, wow. Does anyone ask you what it was like? No, what, nobody has. Nobody has. Yeah. But... Okay, tell me, because the first 20 years, uh, I got to interview playmates and write the stories that went along with them Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's what was expected of junior editors also I was one of the single editors so I have heard all of the different ways playmates came to the magazine Mm -hmm. and everyone is different Mm -hmm. and 
the experience tended to be uh, an opening. They said that so, finally someone saw them as beautiful. Yes. To be photographed by a Pompeo Pizar is just. Uh, it doesn't happen. That would have like been a dream. Life. That would have been, I would have. Hashtag I mean, I you're welcome. Richard Fagley. <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's oh. who I got. And I have an affinity, obviously, forever. And I, oh, I'm so sad uh, that he's. Fagley was brilliant. All of these guys were patient. Absolutely. And and it's... there's only a handful. I mean, all of you. And this is another testimony to Hugh Hefner. Mm-hmm. He, it, it, a small handful it was very exclusive and and stayed there for you guys stayed there for decades and Peterson, decades and decades exclusive. and you don't see that that doesn't happen no, the ever. loyalty and and the same yes with these photographers a handful and they are all brilliant but he saw that and let them explore yeah. what their he saw people's strengths and would let them explore that. But, but, I, to I, his... but I do want to talk about that, about like our experience. And I appreciate you asking that yes. because nobody has. And I'll, I'll go ahead and, and, we'll and do begin. We'll do at the Playmate yeah. Roundtable Yeah, we're going to well. do it at a Playmate Roundtable. But I can say for me, um, it, it, it was something that fell into my lap. I I wasn't looking to do it. I didn't know what Playboy was. I was discovered by Greg Gorman, and Greg Gorman tested me and, and shot me for German Playboy. Half saw that and then booked me to be January 1993. I was 18 years old, two months out of high school. I was very young. I was very naive. Um, I, I wanted to model. I, I I knew that, and I had modeled since I was 13 years old. Didn't think that this would be the way to do so. Um and absolutely fell in love with photography, um, with all things makeup, skin. Um, I'm a licensed California esthetician. I had a skincare studio for eight years in Newport Beach. That came from I um, I taught myself how to build, build websites. I was the second playmate to figure out the internet was coming. I created and built websites. I have this incredible background in marketing. Um, all stemming from Playboy. All stemming all because from Playboy. That opportunity. But with that said, and then obviously the travel and then the relationships, the family that we acquired from I it. mean, Echo and, and I Hef, met at a Playmate of the Year party. And, and, and immediately you just... Friend. Um, and Hef just was the most gracious, kindest. He was, he was a protector. He Thoughtful. was a mentor. He was our boss. And he was like, he was like a father to us. And he loved every single one of us. He knew every single one of our names. And he was so gracious and, and welcoming and open and always, yes, you can stay at the mansion. Like I never lived in LA. I always lived in Austin and I was always out in LA working and I would always call Norma. Will you ask half if I can stay at the mansion? Cause I'll be working. She said, sure. And she'll call me back. Yep. Have, have said no problem. Um, but I didn't really understand the levity and the gravity of what I was involved in at 18 years old. I certainly didn't even get it until maybe in my 30s. And right at 30, I got very, very burnt out with the whole thing with modeling because I had gone on and and created a website that I did for seven years where I was then producing all of my own content. And with that said, now today, I own 36,640 images of beautiful photos that I created that I produced by setting up, you know, hiring the makeup artists and the photographers and locations. Understanding how to do that. Uh, yeah, production exactly. for me, a production right. for me. And I got burnt out and I I put all of my all of my stuff away. I I have nine covers I'm on. I put all of those away and I needed to kind of decompress from it. And I had a baby and just kind of, you know, let go of that for a while and, you know, was grateful for it. And then in my late 30s, I'm 40. Am I 47 or 48? I don't I think I'm 47. <laughs> um, <laughs> in my um, it was just a couple of years ago and I just really started having a much better understanding of 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 the history and the exclusivity you of and I what both at we the same were time. a part of. And I. I I just I got it. And I was like, I'm going to do something with this. This is all going to come full circle. And now here it is. And and I'm I'm writing. I have I have published stories online. Um, 
I'm, we're creating this podcast and it all goes back to Hef. But, but with that said, I definitely was too young. And I think Karina can speak to this as well. She was 18. They didn't, they didn't warn you about what was about to happen to your life. No. You had, no, I had my hold first on. Anxiety attack tight. before my issue came out. And I, and I got, um, I got so overworked. I hated signing autographs. You know, that first year you're, you're working all the time that BJ Turner said, you're not working anymore because your attitude sucks and you don't even know what you're a part of. And I didn't work for two years. And then I realized, oh, okay. I want to be a part of this. And I started writing letters to all the big people and made sure I went and saw every single person face to face in Chicago offices and in L.A. offices. And then I started working with the top of the top with Tony Lynn and all of international promotions. And, you know, it was it was a really incredible experience. I don't say I, I, I can't say that I would want my daughter to do that at that age. I have no problem with it, but 18 was definitely too young. I have no regrets. And I, I told you, mine I don't have regrets. I just wish that they had, I wish, me. I just wish that they had better, like, I, I, and I told Playmate Promotions this. I said, you know, you should have older Playmates come in and speak to, especially these young girls that are Wendy coming and in I went and give PR them an course. idea of what is about to we happen to their a... lives because we have no idea. And that's the only thing that I would say. But my God, it happened. And thank you, Greg Gorman. Thank you, Hef. And thank you for this journey. And I applaud Hef. And I love him. And I'm so grateful for him. And I'm so grateful to have these conversations with you. And um, the interviews we've had this week have just been mind-blowing. And Crane and I just keep learning so much more. And that's the thing. It's it's the history for yeah, me. It's I mean, amazing. Well, I'll just tell you, uh, Peterson, now that <laughs> we know you're Peterson. We, <laughs> so we, were, we were having bourbon by the fire. I mean, and three all years of these, ago, three years ago, uh, that's some tra- after some tragic uh, we, well, we glamour con. We event. don't go and sign on. I, I don't. Yeah. I hadn't signed autographs and I don't know how many years. And I thought, you know what? I'm I'm going to go do this. I'd love to see some of the girls. Uh, I went to this autograph signing and then Echo and stayed, stayed with, with me and, and we Vegas. sat by the fire and. And I had an idea about a documentary that I I wanted to do because we wanted to give a proper send off and farewell to him. Well, because we're also furious about the books that came out from Holly and his other girlfriends that were absolutely atrocious and were not correct to who he was as a human being and as a man. That we're, was not our truth. Yes, yes, it was their truth. And, and so and we wanted. To I never felt threatened ever, ever once. Never, never ever ever. He was a gentleman. I I, I felt the safest I ever did. But I was a kid, Peterson, and and for me, I w- I wouldn't even get naked in front of my friends. I always put my t shirt. I was very modest, and I had a I I mean I'm not going to go into mine like like um, Echo did. But long story short, I mean, uh, Hef gave me a chance. You I are mean, who you are today end, because of it. Yes, and I ended up testing, and I thought my boyfriend was crazy. He found an ad in the paper, and I'm like. Playboy or Playmate. Yeah. I called my mom. I said, uh, you know, my boyfriend wants me to do Playboy. Can you believe it? And I thought it was horrible. She goes, yeah. <laughs> Not knowing that my grandpa was a collector and, you know, they were all excited. They all came to my Playmate of the Year party. But Long story short, it was it, so many details that came together that was not only meant to be, but I was prepared for mm-hmm. Um God's humor, really. <laughs> and I, again, here we are. But but for me, the fascinating thing is the freedom of it and getting to experience things I never would have and meeting mm-mm, fascinating mm-mm. people such as yourself yep, and understanding yep, yep. this living, breathing brand and yep. how many incredibly no longer colorful breathing, human but... beings mm-hmm, mm-hmm. are a part of it mm-hmm. and and then hearing your story it's fascinating it's it's yeah good stuff we are learning just so much jim and it's it's and we're going to have a party oh, by yeah. the way yeah tell. by the way we're go- we're going to do a we're party in the, that's going to be a memorial service the a way huge celebration of life should have been done for the man that launched all of our careers mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. really made an impact in our lives and we didn't get to say and goodbye and we didn't get to say goodbye and 
and we would love to do a, a party in honor of him. So mm-hmm. we're putting that together for all the 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 staff. The way place, he would have friends, had a party for exactly. us. The exactly. way he did have a exactly. party for us. As if you're watching it, walking into a party at the mansion. And we get to say goodbye. And mm-hmm. we would love to have you there, yep. Peterson. So um we're we're gonna we're gonna do this. So yeah. and just, what do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Dedication to have what do you think, Peterson? What do you think? Tell us. Um, I, the night Hefner died, I was having dinner with Arthur Kretschmer and it was also the night my first grandchild was born. Oh, wow. And, uh, so Arthur and I, I drive Arthur to these dinners out that we still have. Uh, and, uh, we sat and talked about the Hefner we knew. Yeah which I've alluded to the man who did the work Mm -hmm. and who trusted. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, then I I just in passing, I I said, you know, my grandson will grow up into a world that has forgotten half by the time my grandson is old enough to be interested in the things that half was interested in. He will have faded. And uh, it bothered me that, the coverage of his death was hashtag will miss the mansion party. It was terrible. Party. It was awful. It was you awful. Know. That's what um, we're doing. We're not. It was not. A, it was not. We're not letting it happen, uh-uh. Peterson. We're. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to let it happen. <laughs> so it is. Um, and uh, I've had drinks with the people around campus who were at working there, and it's always a, a very solemn sad and strengthening dinner to just share the stories Mm -hmm. um that uh i had worked there what 40 years and never heard the goldfish was looking in the wrong direction (laughs) see all of us we learn from all all, we're all learning from each other it never gets old it's Mm -mm. it's Beautiful. There's so many little golden nuggets of history that we're pulling out from everybody and it's and we, we are would love so to get- grateful. And I tell you, Hef is with us. Pat Lacey has been with us this whole time doing our recordings. And she said, Hef is here right now yes. with you girls. And he is so happy. And he is so grateful. He did not get the proper send off. And we are not Mm-mm. going to allow that nope. to happen. So that's what we're doing. <laughs> and we, we're grateful that, that you're a part of it. Yeah. Well, I wish you guys luck. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's important. Three words. You know, I, three words. Wait, wait one second. Okay. Because I think it's important, like you said, that when your grandson was born, and that's what you thought, that, wow, my grandson's going to grow up in a world that, you know, it's a faded memory. And that shouldn't be. Or dirtied. That should never be. It's been dirtied. Because right, or of dirtied. the movements and, it, and the cancel not, culture yeah, and the right. hashtag Me Too and the overboard yeah. babies. So. Tired of it. Yeah. Tired of the I, First Amendment rights. <laughs> Amen. First to that. Amendment rights. I love that Hef was such yeah. a big advocate of that. And that the HMH Foundation is solely for that. So so three words, just three words that you would describe Hugh M. Hefner. Hmm. <laughs> Get it right. Yes! <laughs> oh that's my gosh! Awesome. That's, that's awesome. the best. Thank Get you. It right. Nobody said that one yet. I love that. Get it right. But he just did it in one, Excellent. one shot. Excellent. All right, my dear. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We really enjoyed this conversation, Peterson. <laughs> 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 Here we are. You know, thank you. An honor. And if I have any, if we have any other questions or anything, we can give you a call, right? And talk. Yeah. Okay. And anyone uh, else you think that might want to come on yeah. and tell their story, well, like Bruce, you said, Bruce so many, and it's comforting come on to everyone. There's a lot of people that are coming on still. Yeah. yeah. So. It's, there's so many, so many people beyond the 10th floor that became yeah. 680. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. We know that. But, oh, th- th- this is completely, 
Uh, it's the one story I think I mentioned in our pre-interview that uh, when I was doing the book, I asked Seth, well, what do you think you did? How did you change America? And he said, I invented living together. <gasps> I love that. I invented living together. And uh, I went and did the numbers in 1970. The census said that there were something like 75,000 Americans living together. These are things that no one would think about. Mm -mm. Uh, living in sin, fallen women, despicable men, 75,000. By 1980, there were over a million. And I don't even know the number today. He made it acceptable. He made it uh, attractive. He had Barbie Benton and Lillian Muller and the you know, uh, love of his life sharing space in a mansion, but without wedlocks, without posting bands, mm -hmm. and said, this is what it looks like to do it. And um, my generation said, good idea. Mm -hmm. I like mm -hmm. that. And that they was, got on board. <laughs> and they got on board. And that's just, and that that was what he knew he personally had, had, had done. done. Yeah. But he never uh, spoke he would he, he was never not a man to take own praise horn nope. or, or no, say nope. i did this nope. or nope. i did, and we're finding out more and more just private little philanthropy yeah. uh, you know his philanth i mean we found some really interesting stuff out about the, the zoo, zoo and the and zoo his contribution yeah, to I mean, rare exotic animals across the board. and and um, yeah. So, uh, so, so I want to I want to end it with and I want um, people to know that you wrote um, the book called The Century of Sex, which was all about the Playboy history, the sexual revolution, and it was a, it took you three years to write that book, and it was a complete labor of love. Um, and it was edited by Hugh M. Hefter. Right, exactly. Wow. So, people, go get that book. Yes, it'll be eye opening. Is it on Amazon or where can they order your book? You might be able to find it. It's, I found the. I did a collection of sex advice, the Playboy Advisor on Love and Sex. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the first time my name went on the column, or not on the column, but on the concept. I had been the Playboy Advisor for 10 years. I saw a copy of that on sale on Amazon for $509. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying... What? <laughs> what? What? You had yeah. no idea. Yeah. Like, where are my checks? Yeah, where's my what? damn like, royalty? Yes, someone must have really liked the Chinese basket trick. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I really have to but, read this book. Yes, oh, what is that? Up, up, yes. Uh, oh, my God. You can find it much less expensive sure. than that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there are people who put things on eBay and Amazon with a ridiculous price, and someone may pay it. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. All power to it. You never but, know. But okay. All, All right, right, darling. Thank you so very much. Wait, I know have a you wonderful have wonderful evening. We're, we're, we're probably going to have to have you back on again. Uh, the There's way. a couple people that we need back on because it was just one we hour only have, was not enough. We yeah. only have so much. Yep. Uh, we're, we've got to. Our engineers eyeballing yes, us over here. They, they oh, gave okay. us the five minutes <laughs> twenty minutes Someone ago. Has to edit this down, my <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> All like, right, sweetheart. Thank you so very much. It was such you. a pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. Okay. We can't wait to meet you in person at the big party. Okay. Okay. Bye for now. Bye, Goodbye. honey. Bye.